May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh God, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. So, true story. Yo-Yo Ma needed to have his refrigerator fixed. And the refrigerator repairman came and fixed it. And while he was there in the kitchen, the repairman said to Yo-Yo Ma, so I, what I really want to know is how come you left your precious $2.5 million, 266-year-old cello in a taxi cab? How did that happen? And Yo-Yo Ma explained the story of it. And they were jocular and easy with each other. And the refrigerator got fixed, and the repairman went home. And about 8 o'clock that evening, the repairman called. Uh, the repairman received a telephone call, and the person on the line said, hello, it's Yo-Yo Ma. You have left your toolkit here. <laughs> <clears throat> Our text for the day is summarized here. Yo-Yo Ma lost his cello, the repairman lost his tools. You've got a stick, I've got a boulder, he's got a boulder, you've got a stick. And it's not to say to you, well, just then get over it, but it's to say, get into it, get into it. Perhaps as a child, some of you chanted the ditty. I never know about these old songs, but did you ever sing, sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me? Can you do it? Sticks and stones will break my bones, but names will never hurt me. Now, those of you who haven't heard that song need not be excluded, because it's folk wisdom that goes with the text, right? But it's so paradoxical as is the text, because what does it really mean? I can be broken, but not hurt? Well, if you break my bones, you're gonna hurt me. But you're also challenging the hurt through that ditty. I, of course, sang it as a form of self-protection long before bullying became the issue du jour. I sang it when other kids made fun of my clothes, or particularly when they said, oh, you don't have a lunchbox, you just have a bag. And people here in this room today surely have your own injuries, some larger, some smaller. Some of you have been called a faggot. Others have been called the N-word, some big and some smaller. I got taunted because I was a tomboy, and I didn't even know what that was, except that I knew it wasn't a good thing. It wasn't the right way to be a girl. And I would sing, either out loud or under my breath, sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me. You get the ditty. Some of you know that I went to a different high school and junior high every year because my father was employed for the garment industry and we got moved around in the south. And boy, I hated the first day of school. And the only thing that really helped me was having learned this text in Luther League. And I'd walk into those new schools with my New York accent and I'd practice Southern, of course. And then I'd look these kids straight in the eye and say, you know, you're probably as scared as I am. And it got me through. Notice that everybody has injury, some small, some large. Everybody can be afraid. So this week, we're going to find out what the Supreme Court thinks about equality of marriage. And we are going to live with Cuomo's decision not to move forward on the women's agenda in Albany. We may even live with an immigration direction, if not decision, about border control. As the Wall Street Journal editorial put it so well, no amount of border protection will be good enough for some Republicans. In other words, we are in for a week of sticks and stones that will try to break our spirits, I hope not, but they could. Michael preached last week about the rainbow door 
and about how we are ready as a congregation, along with many other congregations in the village, for whatever happens with the Supreme Court. We are afraid about more violence if the decision is positive, and we are afraid about heartbreak if the decision is negative. Micah will preach next Sunday about gay liberation, no matter what happens, and lead us all in spirit and in body in the Gay Pride March. But today, in this middle time, I want to give us a bulletproof spiritual vest, a way through injury of every kind, so that we can experience the trouble of hate unleashed upon us. We need to get into it, not around it and not out of it. We need to dive down deep and not drown, but dive deep enough to wake up to human suffering. We need to know that we can be broken, but not hurt by the breaking. So let me define hurt for you. I'm going to spend a lot of time defining things in the next few minutes. Hurt is when you get a disease and you don't have a diagnosis and you go to doctor after doctor and they can't tell you what's wrong with you and you hurt. Hate, hurt is when your sister beats you up constantly and nobody will listen to you when you tell them that she keeps beating you up. Hurt is when you can't forget what your uncle did to you when you were a child, no matter how much therapy you do or no matter how hard you try, you cannot forget. Hurt is the anxiety of walking around on a street wondering if that guy's got a gun. Hurt is when you lose your job and your partner in the same week. Hurt is when you look for a job all last week and all last month and all last year and you have to wake up tomorrow morning and look again. Hurt hurts. Having a stick in your eye hurts. Having a log in your eye hurts. It makes it impossible for you to see. It distorts what little vision you have. Having something in your eye is distorting and it hurts. The text doesn't say just care about the big hurts or just care about the little hurts. It says care about hurt. It does not recommend drowning in them or living from them. It recommends attention. Pay attention to the sticks and the stones and the logs. It recommends attention to the great suffering of all humanity, yours, ours, and theirs. And so it sets up the false competition between sticks and logs and demolishes it. It says, let's not enter into the hit parade of oppression. Let's not decide who suffers most and help them as though we did not all suffer. And of course, the text goes on to beg the question, if I'm broken, can I ever be fixed? If I'm broken, can I ever be fixed? Like most wisdom literature and ancient literature, it doesn't pretend to answer that question, but boy, it poses it well. It tilts us towards something better than that stupid, weak-kneed, lily-livered word, fix. You want to be fixed? <laughs> Why would you want to be fixed? Isn't there something better to be than fixed? The antidote to suffering in the Bible is not being fixed, but waking up to the suffering. The gospel is the permission and the commandment to enter difficulty with hope. So I'm going to not bother with the word fix anymore because hope is different than fixing. Hope is awakening to the suffering that everyone has. And it's not glue. And it's not masking tape. And it says, yes, you can be broken and you can be healed, but probably not fixed. So I'm going to offer three ways to try to explain this. And I hope they'll make sense. Just three. You think I could do better than that? Well, tell you the truth, I'm so pleased I came up with three. 
uh, given the size of the problem. The fundamental answer first is to get the problem right. The problem is that suffering blinds us. It keeps us from reaching out to the suffering of others, which is the awakening that Jesus advocates. So when we wake up to our own suffering, we are healed from blindness. We're not distorted about it anymore. You noticed in Tom's presentation that uh, the, the singer was thinking about her mother reading all those home improvement magazines all the time. You could argue that that's a really flimsy form of suffering. And some of you here may say, well, I don't really suffer like that, but I bet you've read one of those magazines. And I bet you've tried to redesign your life. Is that suffering? Is that a stick? Is that not big enough? Remember what we all said all the way through Sandy. I had it bad, but other people had it worse. This text tells you not to go there. Don't measure your suffering against other people's suffering. If you really wish you could have a redo of your living room and spend a lot of time harassing your partner about finding the money to get that together, you are you have a kind of stick in your eye, right? You can also suffer by wondering why you've never suffered and become somebody who says, well, I wonder why my life is so shallow or suburban, as in suburban, below those sophisticates down in Greenwich Village who really know how to suffer. <laughs> so you can think that you're shallow or you can think that your suffering is not good enough to qualify in the hit parade of oppressions, but you're still gonna find that you need to attend to both the log and the stick. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but names like shallow or suburban or faggot or the N-word will never hurt me. Get the diagnosis right, everybody suffers. Everybody loses their cello or their toolbox. Everybody ices up in their own broken icebox. The second spiritual strategy is to be able to feel while you're suffering. Yep, this hurts. Not, well, it does hurt, but other people are hurting more. See the entrance into the competition? Is that there's some highly evolved way to suffer, and then the rest of us are down here in the low evolutions appreciating that we do suffer can take you a long way. Like today, we're going to appreciate music. Appreciation gets the log and the stick out of the way. I think that 80% of activism is based in appreciating suffering, in recognizing suffering. It's not in signing petitions. It's not in showing up. It's remembering why you're trying to change the world in the first place. What got you going about this? Why did you come into the world to fix it? What's wrong with it? What happened? I find that um, we can say the name Mark Carson, who was murdered too many times, and we just start that to say, I don't know, I don't feel that anymore. Or we can say that Jean Montreville is still not safe under the new law and not feel it enough. Or we can remember, something showed up in my inbox this week, that killed me, it was a new study, big study, about how one out of three women have experienced sexual violence. One out of three women have experienced sexual violence. Do you know that's the same figure that we used when we founded Women Organized Against Rape in 1969? Do you know that with all this, there is no change in that number? Oh my, how do we get outside of that statistic and into the fact that there are about 50 women, let's say, in this room? Do the math. Three into 50. That's how many women in this room likely have experienced 
sexual violence, then there is a number there that is not budging. So getting the diagnosis right about your own suffering, but also about the suffering of the world, really matters. I enjoyed the graduation speech given at Pitzer University by John Lovett. How many of you saw it? I know we sent it around. Uh, I now I know how many of you open your mail from us. Okay. <laughs> we'll just stop sending it and deal with that. So while we're in recognition moment, or diagnosis moment, let's repeat, repeat a few of his key points. John Lovett is a speechwriter. He spoke at the Pitzer graduation. Uh, get ready for a word you're not supposed to hear from the pulpit. Of course, I'm quoting. Lovett says, we are drowning in bullshit. We live so deeply in a culture of insincerity. You've heard the robot tell you, your call is important to us. <laughs> right. And so what he wanted the graduates to do was to get into it and to name the public suffering of having to hear once or twice or maybe three times a day, your call is important to us in robotic, the new language for the universe. Lovett goes on to conclude that that call is not important to us or them. It is just not, period, nor are we. And that's why his conclusion is that we live in a time of peak BS. So the second spiritual strategy is to get it right that we are all suffering collectively as well as individually. And understand that activism is 80% seeing the public suffering and saying, aha, I see it. Oh my, I see it. Recognizing that we are in peak BS as opposed to letting anybody ever say to you, well, just get over it. Get over it. Get on with it. You're not in as much trouble as those poor starving children in China, so eat your damn vegetables and be quiet about it. So the spiritual strategies are to recognize your own suffering and not be afraid of it, to get the public diagnosis right, the distortions from our inner hurt selves have distorted reality. And the third is going to be a little bit like that refrigerator repairman calling up Yo-Yo Ma, and then the reverse as well. The word fragile appears to be following me around. Have you ever had that where a word just turns up every five minutes? It turned up recently in uh, the evaluation that uh, the personnel committee and the pastor parish relations committee did of my work here. And the word was, um, Judson is a very fragile institution. And it's a place where it's safe to be fragile. And I really did feel that that was a compliment and not a complaint. That it's a place that's safe for vulnerability. Mackie and I have been out in um, Nashville at a conference all week with Auburn Seminary. Um, almost 100 leaders of multi-faith, multi-racial movements hearing about what makes a healthy movement. And the argument there was so much that we imitate biology and become anti-fragiles. How many of you know that word? I didn't know it. It's, a, it's basically how a system that is always evolving receives disturbing input and changes and becomes stronger as it receives that input. It's like has the strength of a free radical in terms of cancer or the strength of therapy that goes instead of for the identified patient, you know what I mean, in the family. There's a, if you go to see a family a systems therapist and there are five of you in the room and the mother and father said, this kid is driving us all crazy and something has to be done about this kid. That kid is the IP. So what you do, what a good therapist does is talk to the other kids. <laughs> or talk to the parents and move the energy off the IP. So what is 
something that's fragile in evolutionary terms. It's disturbing the system in a small way, but it's creating the capacity for the whole system to go on. Whenever we deny or distort the genuine suffering that we experience and others experience, we are taking the strength out of ourselves to cope. We're not being fragile enough. Fragility, vulnerable safety, the emotional fragility so many of us feel, even the twist of trouble being strength in evolution. All these things remind me of what I know about biology. That's how the world changes. Some things come, some things go, it's always moving. I think of another biological notion called the chaotic attractor meaning that changes in the cosmos attract each other to change, especially through the disturbance of equilibrium. Chaotic attractors see logs and sticks as potentials for disturbance and change. Fragile people like us are not just generation last, which people love to say. We're always generation one. We are prepared to let our gorgeous fragility fully into our own human consciousness. It's big stuff, I know, especially when you're trying to find your violin or get your refrigerator fixed. But fragile is fundamental. It lets us see and be. Amen.